Hi, I'm Tom Stone, the National Sales Manager for Thermal Care for Industrial Markets. Today we're going to be talking about how to start up a portable chiller. First, we want to talk about safety. We want you to wear the proper PPE while you do any work or maintenance on our chillers. We recommend at a minimum glasses, but we do want you to follow the requirements of your facility, whether that's including hearing protection, gloves, or even maybe a hard hat. So today, we're gonna be talking about something that's covered in detail in our manual and take you through step by step what is said here so that you have a visual reference for what can be done. The first step in this process is receiving the unit. After you receive the unit and unload it from the truck, you'll want to inspect the crating to make sure that there's no visible damage. If there is, you'll want to document that with photos and on the receiving receipt. That way you can report it to the carrier. As you unbox the unit or uncrate it, you'll want to take special note of those areas that had potential damage to inspect the chiller itself. Then again, you'll want to do a full inspection of the chiller to see if there's any unseen damage that was hidden by the crating. Finally, when you have the unit completely uncrated, you'll want to open it up and use these Schrader valves in the refrigeration circuit to check the pressure. On air-cooled and water-cooled units, the units are shipped with a full refrigerant charge. For a remote air-cooled unit, it's shipped with a nitrogen holding charge. In all cases, the system should be pressurized and that will cue you if there's any potential damage from rocking around while shipping. After you've received the unit and ensured there is no damage from shipping, that's when you'll begin the actual installation process. The first step in that is the floor where the unit will be located. You're going to want to be sure that it is a level, solid, non-warping surface like a concrete pad or even maybe a steel rigid structure. Then you want to consider the airflow. That considers both the discharge and the inlet air on the back side. The discharge air is the now hot air that has actually cooled the system and that is discharged into the surroundings. You're going to want to make sure that that air can be evacuated and turned over so that you don't continue to recirculate that hot air in this area. On the back side of this unit is where the inlet air comes in and you're going to want to make sure that has clearance enough for proper air flow. Then, on this side, you're going to want to have proper clearance for the maintenance so that you can have access to the unit and you're not hindered by any other equipment around it. Finally, the relief valves for the refrigeration circuit will need to be piped in so that they properly evacuate in compliance with your local codes. After you've determined where you're going to locate the unit and ensured that you have all the proper clearance, you're going to need to install your water piping. For chilled water systems, you want to make sure that piping is insulated. Anytime it's uninsulated, you could have condensation, which adds an additional heat load and operating costs. You also want to have service valves in those lines should the chiller ever need to be serviced. If you have a water-cooled unit, you also need to install that piping for the condenser. You want to have service valves there too, and maybe even consider insulating it depending on the humidity of your area. Then, we need to consider overhead piping. What that is, is when you have the piping discharge off the chiller, it could run up and then over and down to your usage point. In that case, what could happen is when the unit is shut down, that water that's overhead could drain by gravity. So what we can do is Thermal Care can offer a, an anti-drain back kit that includes a check valve and a solenoid valve to stop that from happening. As part of the installation, you could also use a check valve in what's known as an inverted P-trap with a vacuum breaker, and that also stops that drain back situation. Finally, for a remote air-cooled unit, we have a section within our manual that details step-by-step -step how to design that refrigeration piping that would connect the chiller to the condenser that would be located outdoors. That should be done by a certified refrigeration technician and checked with our engineering department. After your piping installation, next you'll want to look at the electrical installation. What you'll want to do there is follow the information that's located on our nameplate on the opposite side of this control panel. With that, you'll want to use the data to properly size your wires, disconnects, and any other safety devices. Additionally, you want to ensure that you're following any local or national codes. Then, with any voltage imbalances in your supply, you'll want to have those corrected before running the unit because you could potentially damage it. Finally, for out-of-phase or reverse-phase chillers, 
What you'll do is in the power terminal block inside of this control panel, you'll want to switch up two legs of your phase from the supply. All of the components within our chiller have been factory tested and are assured that they're in phase. Now that you have the unit mechanically and electrically installed, it's time to turn the unit on. First, you're going to want to have power on to the unit for 24 hours. That uses the crankcase heaters on the compressor to ensure there's no liquid refrigerant in it. That could damage the unit if it starts up like that. Then you're going to want to check to make sure all your piping connections are secure as well so you don't have any leaks. Finally, you open up the cabinet and you fill the tank with the system here. As that is filled, you want to be aware of the water type that you're going to be using based on your application. For cold water or even outdoor systems, you're going to want a glycol mixture to protect from potential freezing. We also recommend that you get in contact with a local water chemistry specialist. They can sample your water and tell you if you need any special treatment to prevent corrosion or any sort of scale buildup in the system. Then, as the unit is on and the pump is running, your system will be filling its piping. There's a sight glass on the back of the chiller here that you'll use to monitor the level of that tank. That tank level will drop as your piping fills. Once you maintain a steady level, you need to stop adding water to the system. Now that the unit's on and we're getting ready to start up the chiller, we're going to want to check whether our condensers are properly set up. For an air cooled, you want to ensure that you have the clearance on the back side for the inlet air and then also clearance for the discharge air out of the top. For a water cooled unit, you want to ensure that that piping is connected securely and also that the valves are open to allow the water to flow. For a remote air cooled unit, you're going to want to make sure that you follow those guidelines in our manual for the design of that refrigeration piping and you also want to ensure that you have power to that actual condenser as well that's installed outside. Finally, you're going to want to check all the valves in your refrigeration circuit to ensure that they're open to allow the system to function properly once the compressor turns on. Next, we need to check the freeze stat setting. On the NQ chiller, we'll use the 7 inch color touchscreen HMI right here. Verifying the freeze stat setting. This is important because it is actually subject to your particular application, so you'll want to adjust this as needed. That menu is behind a password protected setting that's only available after you've set up your user information. After you've done that, you'll do the following steps. Touch the menu, then you touch user setup, alarms, and here at the bottom under low fluid temperature it says fault. You touch this and that is your setting. From the factory it is set at 38 degrees Fahrenheit. We recommend that it should be set at a 10 degree Fahrenheit below the minimum anticipated set point but you also want to be sure to protect with the proper amount of glycol in your system to avoid any freezing conditions, especially if it's an outdoor unit exposed to ambient temperatures. Now we're getting close to actually running the unit. We're going to start by turning on the chiller. When you do that, you could see a high refrigerant head pressure alarm. To reset that, you turn the unit off and depress the button on the high refrigerant head pressure switch, and then turn the chiller back on. What could have caused that was during transit, the chiller could have been exposed to extreme temperatures that would have caused that switch to trip. Then we're gonna hit the start button to energize the internal pump in the unit. There's a flow switch to protect the unit from a no flow scenario in case that pump is not operating correctly. Also, if the pump is external to the system, you wanna ensure that that pump is running and establish flow to the chiller before we hit the start button. We're ready to run the chiller now. We'll start that by entering the set point and then pressing start. The set point from the factory is set at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. You can adjust this as needed for your application within the limits from 20 Fahrenheit all the way up to 80. As the unit's running, it will use hot gas bypass to help the chiller stay on and the compressor continue to operate if you have a low load. Or if you have a variable speed unit, the NQV series, when it starts, it will ramp up to a fixed speed for two minutes and then it will start to vary to match the demand and save energy. After the unit has run for 30 minutes, you'll want to check the refrigerant sight glass. 
In there, you should see clear, bubble-free refrigerant flowing through. If you do see bubbles, that could indicate that you have a low refrigerant charge. Then, after you've done this, the unit is ready to go. You can turn it off and set it up for your true operation. Thank you for joining us today for how to start up a portable chiller, and I hope you learned something.